Welcome to Digital Asset News. Today, I want to talk about is uh, some pretty good story about how PayPal is integrating with MetaMask. This is just going to give us a little bit more visibility and moving forward. Also, I'm going to show you a MetaMask example on my personal phone and show you exactly how this is going to work as you're able to buy crypto through your PayPal account using MetaMask. Also, I want to talk about, not to beat a dead horse, but there's some more worries about Binance. And of course, you know my position on that. Don't leave anything on exchanges. And lastly, we're going to talk about how FTX used your funds to funnel that into a secret account that has around $8 billion into it. So now I, can, I think we know where the money's going. Before we get into all that, let's just take a look at what's going on with the markets and Bitcoin is down. And I do this because I would like to show you the Satoshis to USD converter. Just so you know, you don't have to buy a full Bitcoin. Tell your friends, tell your family, all those things. Uh, Bitcoin right now is over $17,000, but you can buy a ton of Satoshis. Right now, $1, you can get 5,732 Satoshis. That's a lot of Satoshis. And uh, as we move forward, I think that number will only decrease as the price of Bitcoin goes up. So that's just for a dollar. Now, let's break into today's, what I consider a pretty good story. And what we got here is PayPal launching integration with MetaMask. Here's what we have. So the use of the, of the popular MetaMask Web3 wallet will soon be able to buy Ethereum, the second most popular crypto. Similar to PayPal's checkout featured online stores like Etsy and eBay, the integration with consensus MetaMask will let users buy and transfer ETH by logging into MetaMask, tapping the buy button and logging into PayPal before making a purchase. The company said in a statement that select US-based MetaMask customers will be able to use PayPal to buy either Ether as of Wednesday, which is yesterday, today is uh, Thursday, December 15th, and that the feature will be rolled out to all the US users in the coming weeks. This integration will, uh, with PayPal, allow our US users to not just buy crypto seamlessly through MetaMask, but also to easily explore the Web3 ecosystem. That's the big thing, getting people to understand and use it, utility, right? So this was the exact article that it came from. It says it's pretty easy. Add crypto to your MetaMask wallet, log in a mobile MetaMask app, click or tap the buy button, select PayPal, and the desired amount, buy your crypto, done. So I thought about that. I'm like, is that really as easy as it is? So what I did was I loaded up my MetaMask wallet and uh, I taken a look on my personal phone itself. And you can see right here, let me bring this up so you can see it. Here's my MetaMask wallet. Don't worry. I've got a whopping $900 plus in Ethereum. Uh, I don't think it's going to crush me if, uh, if I lose that, but uh, whatever. So what they're saying here is that it's very easy. See that buy button right in the middle? Buy. Right by receive, I'm going to click on buy. And for me, I've got three options because I'm in Puerto Rico right now. And it's, it's not for every U.S. Uh, citizen so far, but this is how it works. So I thought to myself, well, I don't know what the PayPal uh, fees are going to be, but if you do an instant bank transfer, continue to amount, let's say I want to buy a hundred dollars worth, worth of Ethereum. I click done, get quotes. Here's the quotes. It's like six, well, 6.3% essentially what it is. You can see right there, the total fees, uh, I'm going to get $93, $6. And I thought to myself, that's kind of a ripoff is what I think. You can use Apple pay. We'll take a look here. Uh, let's say hundred dollars done, get a quote. And what do we got? Well, same thing, except a little bit le less, but it's 4%. So people who complain about uh, transaction fees, uh, it is no, I mean, it's a, abysmal what you can get. I mean, you can use a debit or credit card, but again, and what are you going to pay? You're going to pay a lot in fees. And just getting the quote right here for all three of those, you're looking at around 4%. So if that's something that interests you, uh, go right ahead. I don't have access to PayPal. I would like to see what the fees are, but I'm going to guess that it's going to be a little bit higher. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Let's move on to our next piece where we talk about Binance. So not to beat a dead horse, but Binance proof of reserves raises red flags. And when we take a look here, I've been talking about this for quite some time. I'm very leery on Binance. Of course, that's why we have the rules underneath me. It's all gone. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Don't leave anything on exchanges. We think we've all learned a lesson with that one. Don't use leverage and take profits along the way. I think that uh, helps me out. You're free to use those or discard them, whatever you want to.
but it's these types of mentalities that makes me look into finance. So as I noted by a former financial accounting standards board member and investment manager, and we're talking about the Binance audit that was put out. We've talked about this three or four times now. At first it looked good, but now we can take a look at liabilities. Liabilities are put out there, but the wording was a little bit off and it's just not as transparent as you'd like it to be. But as according to the uh, uh, standard board member financials, it lacks information related to the quality of internal controls and how Binance's system liquidates assets to cover margin loans. Another red flag, lack of information about Binance's corporate structure. I didn't know this, but Binance's chief strategy officer, Patrick Hillman, was unable to name Binance's parent company as Binance has been going through a corporate reorganization for almost two years. Now, look, I don't know how long it really takes for a uh, massive multi-billion dollar uh, corporation to reorganize. I've never been in control of one, but uh, two years seems kind of lengthy. Correct me in the comments section. Maybe that's just normal, but it gets a little bit more dicey. John Reed Stark, senior lecturing fellow at Duke School of Law and former chief of the SEC's Office of Internet Enforcement stated this, Finance's proof of reserves report doesn't address effectiveness of internal financial controls, doesn't express an opinion or assurance conclusion, and doesn't vouch for the numbers. I work at the SEC for 18 plus years. This is how I define a red flag. And then moving forward, it's not just about that, but it's about the things that, that uh, CZ says. And before he's had this tone where it's like, look, if you're gonna spread FUD, you're not gonna make any money, you're gonna stay poor. That's one of his tweets. Not exactly, but that's essentially what he said. In this next one, he says, look, you can custody your accounts, but only 1% of people can handle it right now. now. I'm not for sure if he's talking about the global population or the population that is in crypto right now. I personally believe we are smart enough to figure out how to custody our own accounts. I think you're smart enough. You're right here. I think you're in the right place at the right time. Also, if you need help with doing those things, I got this website. It's 100% free. It shows you all the, the ways to self-custody, how to use a MetaMask, and you can use those in all the different modules. Uh, one of those being module five, how do I use a MetaMask wallet right there? And I'll tell you to do staking and how to do everything with your uh, ledger and so on and so forth. So just as a refresher, that's what we got. So this is what the article states. CZ came out and said, look, most people, for 99% of people today, ask them to hold crypto on their own, they'll end up losing it. Holding crypto on one's own wallet is not risk-free. More people lose mon money holding their own, they lose more crypto when they're holding on their own than a centralized exchange. Again, I don't know if he's talking about the general mass population in the world or crypto population, but I will warn you. You know who also said that? That exact, almost the exact same thing. It was Alex Mashinsky from Celsius. And he said, more Bitcoiners have lost Bitcoin than anybody else. He goes, over the years, that's actually happened. I personally think people can figure it out right now. It's not that tough. But uh, let's just keep going into this article. Again, these types of comments make me a little leery. Holding crypto is not risk free. Uh, yeah, yeah, we talked about that. And then moving down, most people are not able to back up their security keys. They will lose the device. They will not have the proper encryption. They will write it on a piece of paper. Someone else will see it and they will steal those funds. Look, just use what I use. It's called a uh, stone book or a shield folio, link in the description. You write it down on a, on a book. I've got three myself. One is in a safety deposit. The other two are uh, scattered about in my different houses. And that's what I have. The Binance executive also stated that even when self-custody funds are properly managed, if a person passes away, they don't have a way to give it to their next of kin. Custodians like Binance can implement a standard operating procedure. The Binance executive clearly that different solutions have different risk profiles, and that is up to the user to decide what is best for them. I got to tell you, this last statement, he's 100% correct. So if you have a will or a trust or something like that, you can put that in there, and hopefully people will figure it out. But I know the majority of you don't. You don't have a will or a trust right now to do these things, to transfer over to the next people. But look, I mean... Anybody can go any day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in uh, a local attorney here who deals with wills and trusts, and he's going to come in here, hopefully do a uh, live session. And we're going to answer some of your questions about how to do those wills, how to do those trusts and move forward. Because I personally believe it's important that we plan now instead of planning at the very end when something happens, we you know walk across the street, hit by a bus, something else uh, that goes about. And also, 
I know it seems like a, like a long way away, but right now, just remember that this bear market, these bear markets are when everybody makes all their, all their money. It's not in the, in, in the bull market. It's not like when, when you're buying uh, Solana at $200 plus, it's when you're buying that at $10 or whatever else it is. It's not when you're buying uh, Cardano at uh, almost $3. It's when you're buying Cardano at six, seven, eight cents. That's what I did in 2017 or 18, excuse me, worked out pretty well. So think about these things. Think about the here and now and go from there. And lastly, just to talk about a little FTX news. FTX was caught depositing $8 billion of customer money into secret accounts. So my wife <laughs> sent this to me this morning. And she tells me right here, she goes, I told you that money is somewhere and someone's going to be very rich. And uh, she's exactly correct. So where did the money go? Well, it's been funneled all over the place. In a move to make sure the hedge fund assets were never sold off, FTX began to have issues and engineers secretly changed software code in the FTX system. The software would have sold all of Alameda Research assets, just like any other companies that were owned. In the case of FTX filing for bankruptcy, that would have happened. FTX Exchange Co. was tweaked in the mid-2020s, the mid-2020s, to make sure Alameda Research was protected from an automatic sell-off of assets if the hedge fund was losing too much of borrowed money. There were two ways the Bankman Freed diverted funds. One was the exemption from auto liquidation in the software code, allowed Alameda to constantly increase its line of credit. Most of us know about this. This eventually grew to tens of billions of dollars, becoming, in effect, limitless. The second way is most important, diverted funds was through the $8 billion in traditional money that was sent to secret Alameda-controlled bank accounts. That meant Alameda had no liability because the accounts were never listed on the FTX exchange, which again, makes me very leery about these audits that are coming about. So right now, you can see that there is funds and they are in different bank accounts. And the question is, when do we get that money back? So that is it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. A lot of things to talk about are time sensitive. That is it for today. Thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate you. And I'll see you on the next one. Adios.